Okay. Um, for the record, please state your name and current address. My name is Daniel, initial B. Goldstein. I'm at 6 Ashley Drive, Newtonville, New York. In what year did you join the United States Navy? 1943. Uh, did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I enlisted. Uh, were you uh, regular Navy or Navy Reserve? Reserve. Um, how long did you serve? I served from uh, two years, nine months, and nine days. <laughs> That's, uh, but I was also in the Korean War. Okay. Uh, were you on destroyer escorts? No, time? I was on a destroyer at that time. Um, when you enlisted, how old were you? Seventeen years and nine months. Uh, where were you living when you enlisted? Brooklyn, New York. Uh, did you have any prior experiences at sea? None whatsoever. Uh, what family did you leave when you left home? Mother, father, and grandmother. What were your feelings about leaving? I knew I was going to have to go. I wanted to go. And, of course, it was always sad to leave them, but uh, it was not with a heavy heart that I left them because I knew I'd see them again. Um, what did you do uh, prior to enlisting in civilian life? I was in college. Um, were you a Boy Scout? Yes, I was. Um, what troop? Troop 334S in Brooklyn. Uh, did any aspect of scouting uh, help prepare, prepare you for your Navy experiences? Yeah, there were some things that uh, uh, gave me uh, an edge on some of the other guys who went through basic training. Like tying knots, we had to go through all that. Like swimming, like uh, semaphore. Uh, Working as a group, leadership, did any of that help? Mm, no, not really. Uh, when you joined the Navy, what were your first experiences? For the first time in my life, I ate, uh, what the heck is that stuff? It was terrible. Uh, the beans and, uh, I can't think of the name. It was awful. It was my first night in boot camp. And I said, I'll never make it through if I have to eat this I, I stuff. It couldn't have been the SOS. There's no no, no, the SOS was in the morning. Yeah. Uh, no, this was a uh, Mexican dish. Chili. Chili. Okay. Where did you go at boot camp? Uh, Newport. Newport, Rhode Island. Newport, Rhode Island. Um, what were your impressions of boot camp? Well, it wasn't Boy Scout camp, that's for sure. And uh, my impressions were that we were there to get trained as quick as as best as can be, uh, and try and learn as much as we can. My impressions were the leadership we had, uh, and our recruit company. The man in charge was a seaman first class. Now, going into the navy, a seaman first class is really low, but this guy was like God until I graduated boot camp. After boot camp, uh, more training or immediately went to the ship? No, I was one of the lucky ones. I was sent to uh, radio school in Boston, Mass. And after that, to, to a destroyer escort? No, I was assigned to a destroyer escort crew that was being formed in uh, in Norfolk, and we were sent down there for more training and to await our transfer to the ship. What was your uh, first experiences, uh, well, I'm sorry, uh, what destroyer escorts did you serve on, name and numbers? Uh, USS Leslie L.B. Knox, DE-580. And uh, how long did you, uh, during what period did you serve on these ships? From this March ship? of 44 until July of uh, 45. You, you mentioned you, you were assigned to a, a crew. Uh, uh, what was your first experience with the actual ship? 
when we were shipped up to Boston to pick up the ship and uh, we were up in the Fargo building in Boston that's where the crew was all put together and they came from all over the country and then they took us up to Hingham Mass where we uh, put the ship in commission was the ship built at Quincy? Or? Yes. Yeah. Did it appear uh, large, small when, when you saw it? Well, I guess initially uh, it appeared fairly large. Um, what was your first at sea experience on the destroyer escort? It was the shakedown cruise. So you were a plank owner? Yes, I was. During the shakedown cruise, did uh, everything work as planned? Never. <laughs> That's why we asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't work as planned either. Yeah, that's true. Can you, can you t give us a little insight to how the uh, Shakedown cruise went? Well, I thought I would never live beyond the first night because as we left Boston Harbor, uh, I was on watch with another radio man and we had a pail between us, a bucket. And we were trying to see which one was going to weaken first and puke. And from there it went downhill. Where, where was the shakedown cruise to? Bermuda? Bermuda. Yeah. Uh, where did the ship go next? Bermuda, we went back to uh, the Boston Navy Yard for uh, minor work adjustments, tightening up, tuning up, whatever you want to call it. And then we went to, let's see, Navy Yard Charleston Mass for post-shakedown availability. Then we went down to Norfolk to pick up our first convoy. So then it was, uh, uh, what what theaters, uh, so it was pretty much North Atlantic for a while, and then? Yes, we made two convoy trips across the Atlantic with large convoys. There were two DE uh, divisions. There were six Navy DEs, six Coast Guard DEs, and the flag was in a Coast Guard cutter. And then uh, after that? to the Pacific? Or? Well, after that, we wound up in the Pacific after two trips across. We went into, the first trip was to uh, Bizzerti in North Africa, and the second to uh, Palermo in Sicily. And that was like three weeks across, a week there, and three weeks back, so that was seven weeks all in all. And we had a yard availability in between trips. Was that uh, during the invasion of Sicily or after that? No, this was after. Okay. And uh, if you can just give us a rough idea of the other the places in the chronological or the ship, you know. From? Well, you went to the North Atlantic, then, then to, through the canal. We went back to New York. We all had leave then. I'll never forget that. And in the November of 1944... That was a very momentous month. I met my wife. Oh, yeah. I don't know where it is. Here it is, right here. Hold the phone. Hold the <laughs> Our second convoy, we were in New York for a while, which was great for me. And then uh, we left the beginning of November. We were issued heavy weather gear and all those good things that you needed for uh, winter duty in the Atlantic where we proceeded south and went through the canal into, uh, into the Pacific and we went to the Galapagos uh, we, we took the southern route, we didn't go to Pearl let's see, I have to refer to this again we're still in Palermo Here we have the Galapagos. From there we went to Bora Bora and the Society Islands. 
From there we went to Manus in the Admiralty Islands. And then we went to Hollandia, New Guinea. We went to the Provis Bay and the Solomons. We went back and forth there. Okay. Uh, when you first boarded the ship, what was your uh, rating and rate? Seaman first, RM. How did you learn uh, about the uh, shipboard routine? We were issued watch quarter and station bills. And uh, at the division meetings, all of this was explained to us, exactly what this was all about and what was expected of us. Uh, did you spend any time as a mess cook? Not aboard ship. Okay. Uh, did you advance to a higher rate? Yes. And by what means? Uh, time and rank. Um, what shipboard equipment did you operate? All radio receivers, transmitters, uh, encoding devices. We weren't allowed to use the, uh, the coding machines themselves. Only the officers could use that. Uh, I also was pretty good with the signal lights. Okay. Did, did you operate Huff Duff by any chance? I didn't, know. Okay. Was the, uh, did the equipment always work as planned? Well, the equipment, I have to say, from my recollection, always worked well. Of course, there were a lot of interferences in the radio, uh, but we had uh, backup receivers. For the most part, our work was just receiving messages. And the equipment was fairly easy to operate? The equipment was all excellent stuff. Easy to maintain. Easy to maintain, okay. Uh, besides operating the uh, equipment, was your rate uh, involved in the performance of any other duties? Yes. And that would be uh, what I described to you was my duties during normal steaming. For general quarters, I was a gun captain on 20 millimeters. Okay. That, that might come up again. Uh, what watches and watch sections uh, did you routinely stand? In terms of, uh, well, the normal radio watch, which was four, ye four hours on, Eight off? And eight off, except it was dogged in the afternoon. Okay. Uh, dog, dog for dinner? It was, it's four hours, except between uh, four and six and six and eight in the right. evening. Yeah. Uh, what were your specific duties during the watch? Okay, I would, uh, we would spell each other. There were, two op there were three radio men on watch, two of which operated the receivers and copied code messages. The third one would spell us off because it got very tedious because it never stopped. Um, did the watch sections vary based on readiness conditions? Not really. Not really. Because I can tell you one thing, the radio, sh uh, the radio shack was never secured at sea, even when we came into port, unless we could arrange guardship between a ship that we were tied up to, if that was the case, we had to keep maintaining our normal watches. Okay. So you're a three section in, in port or, or even? Uh, did you favor uh, one watch over another? like the mid-watch or the morning watch? or Not really. Not really. Uh, were there any uh, hardships uh, encountered during standing watch? Cold, hard, wet, uh, boring? Uh, all of the above? All, all <laughs> of the above? No. Uh, if I was to think of one thing, was the fact that uh, radio men are noted to be heavy coffee drinkers. And we had people that came around during the watch with this big pot of coffee. And usually it was pretty rotten coffee. So we complained about it. 
Uh, and they said, well, you don't want coffee? We'll give you hot soup. And what happened was the soup put everybody to sleep. Right. So you had to maintain a high degree of attention and attention oh, to yeah, detail yeah. for a long period of time. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that, that your duties uh, varied during gen general quarters. Um, yes. You, you were a gun captain on a 20 millimeter. 20 millimeters. Okay. Um, but how long would you remain at general quarters? Sometimes it could be 10, 15, 20 minutes. Other times it could be two, three, four hours. Okay. But how frequently would you be called to general quarters? Thank goodness it wasn't as frequent as every day or every other day. Um, during, during the shakedown period, did you perform general quarters uh, drills often? And how? Uh, how long would it take you to man uh, general quarters? Me, it took no time at all because my station was right outside of the radio shack. You're talking about the whole ship? Yeah, roughly. Well, it was never soon enough for the captain. Uh, the more you drilled, did the time improve? Oh, yeah. Um, specific general quarters exercises you were involved with uh, gunnery exercises? Yes. Shooting at uh, target sleeve. sleeves? Yep. Um, the more you drilled, did the performance improve? Yes. And what about confidence levels? I would say yes. During the drills, did everything always go as planned? No. No. Any specific instances you can remember? Or? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, I had two guns under my so-called command, and my job was to relay the, uh, the instructions from the bridge to my gunners, okay? Now they started shooting the five inches first and then they went to the 40s and the 20s were the last ones. And the instructions were, don't fire the 20s until you get the word. And I had two nervous gunners, okay? And any time they thought they were close enough to hit something, they pulled those triggers and they fired without the appropriate order. So it was my responsibility to hold them down which I just, it, it, it didn't happen. A little quick on a trigger all the time. Boy. Uh, did you have any uh, uh, duties during special C details? No, during? because we were on watch. Okay. We, we either were, if, if we were not on watch, we had a muster in uniform on station. Uh -huh. On parade, I guess. Did you have any active role during uh, refuel, underway refueling or replenishment? No. no. Uh, did you ever have the, uh, the uh, thrilling experience of riding in a bosun chair? No. Right. Dan, you're not going to get anybody who ever rode it. Okay. I've observed it a few times. Okay. While on destroyer escorts, who was your commanding officer? Or officer. The skipper was James Andrew Moffat the oh. third. He came aboard as a lieutenant and made his half stripe soon after being on board. This is uh, father of the admiral. Moffitt. Father of the admiral, uh, president of Corn Products Refining Company. He was well up there. Yeah. Uh, what leadership style did did they use? Was he by the book? He was pretty much by the book. Yeah. Uh, was he uh, detached or very personal? No, he was very detached, very remote person. Uh, did you have any uh, first-hand experience in officer's country? Did your duties involve contact around the wardroom or captain's cabin? Yes. Um, As a matter of fact, the radio shack was uh, right next to the captain's stateroom and right at the base of the bridge. And besides which was part of my duties, uh, if I had the time to run message, you know, route the messages around to the appropriate officers. Um, were you ever involved with a captain's mass uh, as a defendant or observer, uh, observer? No. No, I was a good boy, but I never got a good conduct ribbon. Okay. 
Uh, what was your overall impression of uh, the quality of other officers other than that, Captain? Uh, generally, I thought they were pretty good. We had some fellows who, to me, were like a hero. We had a, we had a, a gunnery officer. His name was Quinn, who was a graduate of uh, Notre Dame, played football for him. He was a great guy. We had a, a communications officer, Mr. Sanborn. He was also a regular guy. Uh, the executive officer was an income poop, but I guess you had that no matter where you went. Yeah, it's the luck of the draw. Did you observe a, a, a contrast between the, the uh, commanding officer and the exo's style? Oh, yes. What about the uh, chiefs and leading petty officers? Well, the chief radio man was an old China, a China hand. So he was, uh, he was a very, very obese individual. And I was concerned about him because when you went to general quarters, all the hatches were dogged down except for that one circular opening in the hatch. And I didn't think he'd be able to get out of that thing. Uh, the chiefs were real specialists. I had a lot of respect for the chiefs. When they say that the chiefs ran the Navy, I really believe that. Uh, did you have any leadership responsibilities? Not really. Oh. Not, a, not as a third class. Okay. You don't get any lower than third class. Or seaman. <laughs> That's true. Uh, any comment on storms and rough weather? Well, we've we had storms and we had rough weather. And I remember one time being up on the bridge. Uh, we were approaching the East Coast, and it was really rough. And I was watching the clinometer up on the bridge, watching that swing back and forth. And at that time, my stomach had settled down so I could take all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing, uh, it was one of the new battleships. It was either the Iowa, or it was, the, it was the Wisconsin had passed us. I said, gee, it must be nice being on one of those things. It doesn't even move in this kind of weather. It just sits there. How far was the uh, inclometer moving when you... Oh, God, I don't remember, but I, you know... <laughs> it went... Easily 45, huh? Yeah. The only other... Th Are we going beyond World War II on this? You, you can talk whatever you want. Because in Korea, I told you, I was on a destroyer. And uh, we were sent down into the uh, the Caribbean and we had hurricane duty. We would go into the eye of the hurricane. And the eye of a hurricane is very, very calm. And we would plot the course of the hurricane and radio it back. Now, me as a radio man, that was one of the responsibilities I had. Uh, the message was, was made up, and I would have to contact, uh, it was probably Washington, and send the message. And here we went down in the Caribbean. And I get on the key and I try to raise Washington. Can't, can't raise him. What do I do now? But I got an answer back from NPM, which is Radio Honolulu. And they said, we hear you loud and clear. We'll relay the message for you. And I thought it was halfway around the world. So I thought that was pretty novel. Yeah, you were getting some good what, skipping. Or What destroyer was that? The Ingersoll. Okay. DD-652. Uh, single five-inch bounce? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Fletcher class. Fletcher. During the storms uh, and rough weather, what about uh, everyday activities like eating and sleeping? How were A lot of fellas didn't even bother to eat. You know, until we got our sea legs, it was kind of rough. But even, even when you got your sea legs to go down through the mess hall, it was kind of rough. The, the, uh, the trays would slide down the tables and the food would slop all over. It was kind of messy. But we took it as something that we had to go through, that's all. And what about sleeping? Sleeping was, was really never a problem. 
you, you get in your sack and you sleep regardless of how the ship bounces up and down. You need to tie yourself in or? No. No. I never did that. See, I, I had my, uh, we had these canvas bottoms in the bottom. And I had my loosely tied, so there was, when I got in there, I was in there. I okay. Could. <laughs> uh, you mentioned earlier the ship participated with convoy duty. Uh, yes. With, with how many convoys? Two. Two. Two in the Atlantic. Okay. Uh, Two large ones. Was the convoy routine uh, monotonous, grueling? Generally speaking. Uh, I understand that your ship, the uh, L.B. Knox, was involved with uh, uh, a few anti-submarine actions. Can you relate these experiences? Yes, well, uh, going over, there were numerous contacts, and they had to be followed up. Nothing, to my recollection, ever happened from those contacts. They were just followed up. Either the sub got away, or it was not a sub, whatever. What, did the uh, radio men monitor the direction finding equipment, or no. was that, that was a different rating? Um, I understand that the uh, LB Knox was involved with uh, any aircraft actions. Later. Yes. Yeah, uh, we went through the Mediterranean and off the coast of North Africa. We were attacked by uh, German torpedo bombers. But I think there's something in here about that. That's where I'll get it. Okay. Uh, here we go. July 12, 1944. Enemy planes in vicinity of convoy. Sighted and engaged enemy bomber on torpedo type run. Planes retiring, ceased fire. Then later on that same night, sighted and engaged enemy bomber dead ahead. Planes retiring, ceased firing. No apparent damage to the enemy. Were you firing the 20s? Did they? Well, they said before, we fired everything. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I also understand that your ship, the uh, L.B. Knox, was involved with the uh, landings at Lingayan Gulf, yes. Philippines? Yes, that's true. We, we, we actually were sent up there, I would say, on a convoy basis to bring the, to, uh, the convoy, the troops up, and the supply ships and whatever. And we also supplied uh, a group of uh, men to go in with the landing on our whale boat, which I was one of. Oh, really? Can, can you relate a little more about that? Nothing except that I was very scared. It was in the middle of the night. Uh, and we couldn't see a damn thing, except that by the time we were close to shore, we had signal lights from the left and from the right and from straight on ahead. The, uh, the Filipinos had cleaned out everything, so we had a, where we were, it was a clean landing. We had no problems at all. That's a little unorthodox, really. It's a unorthodox? Yes. Not really. Really? It was fun. <laughs> they gave me a gun I didn't know how to shoot. M1 or a 45? No, one of those uh, Thompsons. Uh, Thompson. Yes. Yeah. Also, I think they strapped out a 45, but I didn't have any ammunition for it. Do, do you know what the purpose of that was? No. no. But I had a radio okay. that I was supposed to use if I needed it. Okay. Um, wh what about meals aboard ship? Was the food good? I, I, my recollection is that the food was generally good. Got better from boot camp, huh? Well, boot camp wasn't that bad. I got used to it. Okay. I just didn't eat the chili. Uh, what about the usage of water? Did you have an unlimited supply? No. Water hours? We had water hours. 
And that was the one time where I almost got pulled in on a captain's mast because uh, we were allowed one shower a day. And the shower consisted of going into the shower, getting wet, stepping out, soaping yourself down, getting back in, letting the soap off, get out and dry. Okay. Well, I had taken a shower in the morning, and then I was doing some work down in the bilges. I had some dirty work down there, and I was filthy. I said, the hell with this. I went and I took another shower, and we had a shower petty officer, I think the water petty officer, whatever he was. Didn't I see you here this morning? I said, that's right. So he took my name, but nothing ever came of it. I was a, new, uh, a radio man in the Belgians. That's usually an engineering function. True. Yeah. To, clean, to clean the Belgians? Yeah. That was punishment. Oh, it was punishment. Okay. Um, the chief caught me with my head down on my typewriter when there was no messages coming through. Okay. So he taught me a lesson I never forgot. And you almost had to clean evaporators then. I would. Clean the evaporators? Yeah. Uh, we interviewed. Uh, I'm. I'm sorry. Take it off. Yeah. Uh, any humor stories involving uh, shipboard life? Now, I always say that uh, you know the tendency is you kind you kind of remember the good things you don't remember the lousy things, but it was we just made our own entertainment. We had some guys with real talent, real good guys. Uh, musicians, or uh. we had a few musicians. We didn't have any Harry Jameses or anything like that. But I remember coming off watch, and in the early evening, it was, it was still light. We'd go on the fantail. We'd put on impromptu shows. That was our entertainment. Uh, were movies available? Yes. Movies were available in port on the fantail. I wrote sometimes we even had them in the, uh, on the mess deck. What about snacks and treats? What about them? <laughs> Were they available? Uh, to a very limited degree. You know, we had a ship store, which was like a closet. Yeah. And you could get cigarettes, and you could get pogey bait, candy. Candy, yeah. The uh, tropical Hershey bars, the you know, God. So they, they they never wilted in the heat. Right. Uh, did the ship have? Uh, did your ship ever have swim call? Oh yeah, we had a swim call in uh, in Bermuda, on shakedown, and that was almost a disaster. Uh, the guy that used to sleep next to me went over, and he came back, and he started to yell and scream, and he started to climb up the ladder to get back aboard, and he had a Portuguese man of war attached to him. Oh. So that was, that was miserable. He was sick for a while. Uh, field, field day activities, uh, cleaning up the ship, that sort of thing. Yeah, we even did uh, bill scraping. We went into uh, an LSD. That was a landing ship dock. I don't want you to think we yeah. were taking anything illegal. No. And uh, went over the side and scraped the barnacles. She lifted up and, uh, and then... Where was that? That was someplace in the Pacific. Okay. Uh, what about holidays at sea? Uh, Holiday routine. Thanksgiving, Christmas. Yes, Thanksgiving, Christmas... I remember when we were over in uh, in Palermo, Sicily. It was the Jewish, the high Jewish holidays, and uh, they let us. There were maybe ten, twelve of us aboard ship, and they let us go ashore, and we tried to find some place where there was a service, and we found one. It happened to be a bombed-out Catholic church, and. Uh, 
the remnants of the British Army were there. We were there, and some civilians came in. God knows where they where they came from, but they came. That was one thing that always stayed with me. I was very it was very poignant for me. But holiday routine was at sea. No work was done. It was holiday, period. You could do whatever you wanted. And they'd try to get a Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas? Yeah, as a matter of fact, someplace I have my uh, uh, first Thanksgiving at sea. I have the menu and the whole thing. Uh, do you have, have any stories crossing the equator or the international Yeah, airline? Yeah, sure. We crossed the equator. It was, I guess, the end of November of 1944. And the chief radio man, he was King Neptune. You sounded like you should have been the royal baby. But, uh... And they made a mixture of, uh, I guess it was oil. It was the most horrible tasting stuff I ever had in my mouth. We all, you know, we were all, we, none of us were shellbacks until afterward. But that was something. Got a big certificate for it. Um, did you visit any interesting ports of call? Yes, we did. The first one was, the first place we ever hit on foreign soil was Bizerti in North Africa, in Tunisia. And that place was just bombed to smithereens. But we went into the city of Tunis. On the second trip, we made Palermo, which was really, uh, it's an ancient city. The Pacific, there wasn't really much of any interest to me at being 18 years old. Did you get ashore at the Galapa Gal Galapagos? The Galapagos? No, we didn't get ashore there. We got ashore in, uh, where the hell was it? Manus? Bora Bora. Bora Bora. Bora Bora. And we got ashore in Hollandia. Went to a rest camp in Hollandia, which was interesting. My section got three days off to go up to this rest camp. It was up in a mountain, a place called Lake Santani. What do you remember about that? I remember it was in the mountain, it was cold. And down below there was a lake and there were all these black people, the natives. But they all had this white cottony hair. That's what I remember. And they all lived on stilts. This is close to New Guinea, right? This, this is, is in New Guinea. In New Guinea, okay. Uh, it was three days of playing poker and things like that. I don't think there was any really prolonged period where we went without seeing another ship or anything. How did you stay in touch with your family? Mail. How frequent was the mail call? Well, sometimes it was, you know, a couple of weeks until the mail caught up with you. Um, then, when you then when you got it, I got... I had to put the letters in uh, in date order. Yeah. Um, how did you feel when you were finally discharged? Oh, I was ready for it. I didn't know what I was going to do. Was but that 45? Or? No, 40, March of 46. St. Patrick's Day I was discharged. Did you decommission the uh, ship at that time? or? No. Um, what happened to me was I left the ship and it was, it was the end of July of 45, it was before the end of the war. So I applied for a commission and uh, I was accepted into the program and they flew me back from Leyte and went to Guam, Kwajalein, Johnston Island to Pearl Harbor. I got bumped in Pearl Harbor and I came back on a British aircraft carrier from Pearl Harbor to San Diego. To San Diego, I went home on two weeks leave, reported back to uh, Farragut, Idaho. 
That was the staging area for this program. In that time, while I was on this British aircraft carrier, they dropped the bomb and the war was over. Okay. So I really didn't want to go into this program and commit the four years of my time. They were going to pay for all my education in college for four years. But there was the GI Bill. I knew I would take advantage of that. Anyway, I was washed out anyway because I didn't have 2020 eyesight. How do you look back on your destroyer escort experiences? That's, that's a very good question, and I say that because uh, what I said before, what you remember are only the good things. And I have to speak of this, not only of DE experience, but uh, as the Navy in general. Okay. I was not what you classify as a happy camper during the war. I was there because I had to be there. We had to, we had to do something. And uh, it wasn't until recently that it was brought home to me, you know, what a, what a job we did and how wonderful it was and all that stuff. So, and the slate of being here sort of piqued my interest again. And uh, we, we were able to organize a ship reunion. We met in Springfield two years ago. We had 15 guys there. What impressed me about that is we were all on the same ship, 306 feet of it, okay? We were all in the same war at the same time, going through the same experiences, and yet our, recollec our recollections were all a bit different. We can understand that, I think. But um, anyway, to make a long story short, I was discharged as I started going to college and I enlisted in the, na in the inactive Naval Reserve in college in 1947 to help out the uh, Freeport, New York Naval Reserve facility. They just wanted my name. But in June of 1950, they came and got me again. Then I was bitter. I was married. I had started a family. And when I got back abo on board ship on that destroyer, I realized the Navy couldn't have floated anything without recalling the reserves. Did you go back in as a commission officer? Or? No. You had almost finished college by then. Uh, I had finished college. So I had I'd gotten a degree, and after I got my orders as radium in third class to come back, uh, I went down to 90 Church Street in New York, and I said, hey, you guys, I'll be willing to go back, but not as a radium. I'll go back as a supply officer. No, we need you as a radium at third class. So, anyway. Well, thank you for sharing these experiences with future generations. Uh, is there any other comments or anything you would like to add? Not really. I still have very fond recollections of a lot of the guys, people that I'm still friendly with today. And uh, I think it's great having the Slater here, and I'm able to help out in that respect. I go there, I sit in the radio shack, and I put the headphones on, and it takes me back 55 years. <laughs> But it's a great bunch of people that are down there. And they're doing a wonderful job. And I'm just happy to be a small part of it. Pretty soon they're talking about getting it underway. Well, I'll, I'll believe that when it happens. Oh, they're, I, I are they going to put up a sail? Huh? Are they going to put up a sail? Those, those engines, I don't know. They, they found, a, found a, a brand new diesel.